Outrocast. Good afternoon, Jack. How is your day going aside from doing some press? All good. Well, All right. Go ahead. I think I'm fine. I mean, it's it's a typical cold Wednesday in New York. Are you dialing in from Florida? Yes, that's where I live, uh, Central Florida. Right. And uh, on the East Coast. So thankfully, we didn't get hit too hard here. Right. But you made it out of this town, Long Beach, Long Island, New York. Oh, that's where you're. Uh, that's where you live. Yeah. Around what year did you leave Long Beach, Long Island? Well, I graduated high school in 1970, so it's a long time ago. And uh, then uh, my family left in like 74 and we moved to Huntington. Right. Uh, so, which was another really great town. I mean, basically three of my favorite towns are Long Beach, Huntington, and uh, Roslyn, and I'll throw in Patchog also. All towns except for Long Beach that have concert venues to speak of. But uh, when you were living in Long Beach, the Action House was around, right? That's correct, yes. And uh, in fact, I played there. That was probably uh, probably my, the first show I've, I ever did and got paid. Because the Action House is kind of forgotten about because it's not a preserved legacy, but Black Sabbath played there, and The Doors, Pink Floyd, Grateful Dead. What was your band that played there at the Action House? My band was the very uh, first band I had. It was called Cynthia Fever, and the name came from a song on an album by uh, Mark Stein of the Vanilla Fudge. Oh, yeah. He lived in Long Beach as well, yes. and he started a band after the Vanilla Fudge called Boomerang, and they put out one album on RCA, uh, the Record Cemetery of America, RCA. And uh, <laughs> I, I've heard I've heard that about RCA. Sorry to interrupt you. And then I've heard MCA when that used to be exist called the Musical Cemetery of America. Right. Yeah. And uh, so there was a song on the album called uh, Cynthia Fever, and uh, we liked it. We were friends, uh, not so much with Mark, but I mean, I was friends with, uh, they had a 15-year-old guitar player uh, named Ricky Ramirez, and uh, I was older than him. I was all of 17, <laughs> and uh, we played at the uh, Action House. And I think maybe a year later they changed it to the rock pile yes they you know and then it changed names again to industry yeah and and then that was it pretty much you know but it was uh i saw the birds there i saw uh black sabbath uh uh cactus there was a, lo a local band called the illusion that played there a lot hmm. well, saw them and uh and, and I also opened up for uh, Blue Oyster Cult there. Wow. Well, that's a fascinating thing about your career, that it goes back to there, but right. then you were in the whole shrapnel record scene and all the stuff that Virgin Steel did, and you survived the hair metal scene. In other words, it's like this Forrest Gump thing where yeah. I can't go, oh, yeah, Jack, yeah, he... He was active from 80 to 83. Like, you can't do that because you had activity in the 70s, 80s, 90s, today, etc. So, yeah. so yeah. it's That's awesome true. to see that you, you've managed to survive no matter what the coolest music of the moment was. Yeah, and I think really um, a part of that is I just really uh, enjoy music. So for me, I mean, yeah, it would be nice to become obscenely rich. <laughs> I would like that. Sure, why not? But that's never been the uh, end goal, you know. I'm more really interested in creating uh, good music and uh, building on the fan base that I have, uh, who've been really super loyal. I mean, mm -hmm. and so it's a it's a good thing. What I gather about your bands is there's almost this genre is not the right word, but this category of bands where they've always been bigger internationally 
than they are in the States, even though they're from the States. Virgin Steel is a perfect example of that. When I interviewed David like 20 years ago, and he was talking about the three hour shows that they were doing in Greece and Italy and all that, and you go, what? And the Long Island scene doesn't embrace a lot of these artists. I, re I remember hearing that Doro Pesh from Warlock was living here in Long Beach, and you would say to the average person that, uh, that concept to a Long Beach person, and they would go, who? And you go, Warlock, who headlines festivals around the world. In your case, international acclaim, yet not always supported by the local scene. Does that bother you, or do you like that, that you can come home and it's quiet? Well, honestly, it used to bother me, um, and then I moved away. Uh, it bothered me that uh, WBAB, which claimed you know to be a, a rock station, never ever played any of my music except right. once in a blue moon at midnight. Fingers would uh, yeah. play something, but I mean, you would think that. Why not find five minutes and play Virgin Steel or play Burning Star or, you know, you know, I mean, they were playing Zebra like 25 times a day, yes. <laughs> you know, and uh, so it was just ridiculous. And I'm so glad that I don't have to be anywhere near where their uh, sound emanates. And I just, you know. And, and it was just ridiculous, you know. I mean, I was in East Hampton like four years ago. And there's a record shop in, in town. And mm -hmm. there's some young guy with like, you know, really, you know, cool looking guy, you know, hair down to his waist. And and uh, he I think he was about 20 years old. And so they had all a bunch of records outside of the store, records that were like... Uh, records they wanted to get rid of, you know, records that, that meant nothing to the, you know, the record buying public. And I noticed that uh, they had a, a Zebra album and I go, wow, this is cool, you know. I, and then I'm talking to the kid. I say the kid because anybody that's under 30 is like a kid. You know? <laughs> but anyway, I'm talking to him and I go, I go, yeah, you know, this was a really big band on Long Island. I said, you know, you probably, you might have been able to sell it inside. You didn't have to blow it out for a dollar with all the other records. And he goes, oh, I never heard of them. I go, I go, they used to get played a lot. And maybe they still do, but maybe BAB doesn't reach East Hampton or whatever. And I don't think they do. Yeah, I don't think they do either, even though they're based in Suffolk County. It's a very limited reach. Yeah. So once you're in Western Nassau County, BAB gets a little fuzzy, unfortunately. Yeah, so this kid was kind of out of the loop, and I, I told him, I said, yeah, you know, they were really getting the heavy push, like, before you were born in the 80s. And, uh, and, and so I said, well, you know, for a dollar, I'll, you know, I'll buy it. I already have it, but I figured... I'll have another copy, and I bought it, and and then I'm thinking, you know, how weird this is, you know, that here they are, just you know, 20 minutes outside of the BAB zone of influence, and no one's heard of them, you know, and and it kind of made me feel good in a perverted kind of way because it was almost like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, you know, justice, uh, you know, Schadenfreude is that the German. Uh... Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, um, uh, because really, I mean, we were as good as, uh, as Zebra, maybe better because we weren't going out of our way to clone, you know, Led Zeppelin. I mean, you know, they were just like so into cloning Led Zeppelin. It was like embarrassing, you know, but that was Long Island in the 80s, you know. Right. And, right. and I'm not trying to speak bad of them because. You know what they do what they do and they do it well i uh you know and they had a couple of good songs and i don't even know why i got on this tangent of talking well, well, about I, I led you there because i was talking about how certain bands from long island from new york etc have this great career outside of the states and then right. they come back to their local scene out here and yes you're guilty you you brought me there 
But honestly, it just needs to annoy me, you know, it's like Bob, Bob Buckman and all these people and they were playing the same horrible songs like 35 times a day. And I'm not just talking about Zebra. I'm talking about how many times do I have to hear Hart in one day? How many times do I have to hear Ario Speedwagon? Ario uh, Speedwagon? Yeah. Or, or, you know, it's just, or Candle in the Wind by Elton John, or I just, I couldn't take it anymore. And I figured, well, maybe, maybe when I move to Florida, they'll actually have a, a bigger, uh, uh, you know, a bigger playlist. Yeah. But guess what? They didn't either. The only thing that was different is there was no zebra. That was the only thing different. So in a way, that was cool. I didn't have have to hear zebra anymore on BAB. But um, it is what it is. You know, it's still the same songs. Uh, and here is the thing. And, and, you know, I don't know why I'm talking about radio, but I figured you got me there. I'm going to say something. Sure. Um, if you go back 20, 30 years, it's great. Okay, so you're going to play the top five songs or the top or the or the number one song from 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. But it, the interesting thing is like some of the songs that were in the top 30 that never made it past the top 30 are really cool songs and you never hear them on classic rock radio. Yeah. It's a shame. Like, okay, if you're going to talk about, you know, the 60s, okay, so they're going to play Born to be Wild, okay, because that was a song that everybody knows, and it's a yeah. cool song. But why not play We Ain't Got Nothing Yet by the Blues and the Goose? Yeah. Just because it didn't get into the top 20, it got maybe into to number 30, but it was a great song, and it influenced a lot of... Uh, people because it was part of this whole psychedelic garage rock thing yeah that is still big and you know people are going back and they're buying vinyl uh you know so that's what i'm saying and it's the same thing and why just talk about music it's the same thing about um about movies in america yeah. you go to the multiplex and it's the same 10 songs 10 uh, sorry 10 films yeah playing everywhere in america everywhere you could you could have a helicopter drop you off in tucson and it'll be the exact same 10 movies so we're having enforced mediocrity that's a good way of putting it it's it's not just chain stores it's chain music chain films chain everything so chain hotels Chain yeah. supermarkets, uh, and what they do is they kind of create uh, these robots that we claim are humans. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's sad. It's let's have a tiny bit of um, of just individualism again, you know. Sure. And because when you create this kind of society, which we have now. It's an easy setup to buy into whatever the government is peddling, because that's where our mind think is at. You know, our, our we, we're taught to conform. We're taught to uh, only like certain things and only believe in certain things, and and so on and so forth. Well, hence an album like Souls of the Innocent, talking about independent culture and having independent thoughts and being your own person. It's not off brand from what you're saying right there. No, and I'm glad you brought it back. And I, I applaud the masterful way you got back into the interview. <laughs> oh. I am here to plug the new album, which is out on Global Rock Records. Mm -hmm. And it's really doing quite well. And um, so, so I, I'm here to plug it. But you know what, sometimes, you know, it's better to plug things subtly. Yeah, and talk about who you are, what you aspire to, and uh, why, why, why Jack Stowe? Why this guy that persists on making music? Uh, 
with no no tremendous uh, rewards, you know. I mean, I'm still doing it, but where's my Maserati? <laughs> Where is my beachside uh, beautiful villa with my pavers in the driveway? No, I don't have the ten thousand dollars to put pavers in my driveway. It's just it's just a regular driveway. I'm just a regular guy. But am I, but am I unhappy? No. no I'm not. You made an album that reflects the kind of music that you want to make instead of making the album that caters to the charts or specific radio formats or anything like that. You independently went, this is what I'm going to do. You made it. It's out. It, absolutely. You know, and uh, here's the hard part. The hard part is competing with people that have huge budgets. And that's been my, uh, it's like somebody threw the gauntlet at Jack Star and said, said, you, you want to be a schmuck all your life? And I said, no, I don't. Well, then you've got to make albums that compete, not just because you think you're a great guitar player and a great songwriter. There, there's plenty of people all over America that play great and write great mm -hmm. songs. You have to make them sound good. You have to have good production values so that when a 16 year old kid listens to you and they're going to A and B it with the last Iron Maiden album, it's got to be as good. Mm -hmm. And that's what we really uh, strove to do for the last 20 years. Actually, really for the last 40 years, but I think we got really good at it from the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. The production just keeps going up. And part of that is because um, the technology has become more accessible and less expensive. Right. Are, are you big into plugins? In other words, the guitar that's next to you, does it sound exactly like it does through the amp combo or do you use some tricks and tools and all that once it's in the computer? Well, first of all, I'm, I love it. I'll take any technological help I can get, but I'm, but I'm not good at it because I'm an old guy. So you're so, a vintage guy. I'm vintage a vintage guy. guy. Yes. So, so what do I do? Well, surround yourself with people that know what the hell they're doing and are not afraid of technology mm -hmm. in the person of one Kevin Burns. He has every plugin known to man, every amplifier known to man, and he knows how to use it. Yeah. So having him in our corner as co-producer along with Ned Maloney and myself is really uh, just a miracle. You know, um, he's got all these amps called, one of them is, is uh, called Bogner, and they're made in Germany, and they're like the, uh, kind of like the high-end version of Marshall. Mm -hmm. now, I have Marshalls, I have a bunch of them, but there's always going to be something that's going to come along and be better, you know, and so you've got these Bogner amps, you've got uh, all these plugins, and mm -hmm. basically, so I send a signal of sound to the studio, to Kevin's studio, which he's a very modest guy. I don't even think he has a name for his studio. Just it's Kevin Burns' studio, uh, and we send him um, stuff. You know, uh, sound waves that are transparent, so he can color them. And that's the whole thing right there. It's called, there's a term for it. It's called reamping. And uh, I mean, I get a great sound live also. Mm -hmm. but who, you know, who wants to deal? It's just so difficult to deal with it. And the, it has to be reamped so much easier. Uh, Got it. Unless Kevin would take a trip to Florida bring about 25 microphones with him and all his amps and plugins and that wouldn't make any sense right a lot of extra effort there yeah so we use reamping and it works good for us 
Same thing for the vocals. Mm -hmm. Same thing for the drums. So the album is out. For most artists, the finishing the, the album is the hard part, not the promotion. It's out. What's next for Jack Starr? Are you looking for projects ahead or are you going, hey, the album's only been out three months. What are you talking about? It's a new album. This is what we're talking about for a long time. Well, you know, what we what we want to do is generate as much interest and in sales with this album mm -hmm. uh, just so that we become more desirable uh, to play in you know, larger venues. Uh, I don't really want to get into a, a broken down Volkswagen camper and tour. Uh, this is just not something that I want to do. I don't even think I wanted to do that 30 years ago, nevertheless now. Right. Uh, so how do you not do that? Well, you got to sell albums, create a buzz, do lots of interviews like we're doing and like I've done in the last uh, two months. I've done over 50 interviews. Uh, we had a, a good uh, publicist named John Lappin uh, mm -hmm. from Las Vegas and he handles a lot of uh, well-known artists. Mm -hmm. and, uh, our record company Global Rock was really uh, kind enough or savvy enough, either one or both, to hire a great publicist and create some noise. Mm -hmm. So that's what we've done. And we want to, we're, we want to keep creating the buzz, the noise, keep selling more copies. Um, right now, I think the next step is probably going to be, we're going to get a European publicist because since our band is primarily, you know, well known in Europe, that would probably make a lot of sense. Then as the album keeps selling and the reviews keep coming in, the reviews have been really uniformly great. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we could have paid for all those reviews, we wouldn't have gotten better ones. You know, the reviews are just great. And, and they're coming from places uh, that mean a lot to me, like the Midlands of England, mm -hmm. you know, where Black Sabbath comes from, where Iron Maiden comes from. Right. Where UFO comes from, you know, the working class um, music of Britain, music that really influenced me when I was growing up, you know. So that said, you know, we're really looking to continue on that tangent and see if we can create a demand so that we can be um, you know, doing, you know, you know, like, I'm not saying we're going to headline mass and square garden, but it would be nice to do like little theaters, like all over America and in Europe. And I think we're, you know, we're going to come to that point, you know, as the album keeps selling, uh, right. Or, or, you know, or at least, uh, be the, um, the special guest of blah, 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 mm -hmm. you know, and that's, so that's what we want to do. And that's my answer, you know, to the question. Yeah, we could go out and tour tomorrow. We, we're getting offers, you know, from Poland. We're getting offers from Italy. We, we've gotten offers from the Czech Republic. Mm -hmm. We've gotten offers uh, from Germany and, uh, and Greece, which are all places, you know, that we have followings in. But we want to see if we can just up those to maybe... Um, playing in, you know, bigger places. Right. So that, you know, because the, um, it's just, it's the kind of situation, you know, like we have, okay, like the drummer in our band has a regular job. He's a fantastic drummer. His name is Rhino. And if there was any justice in the world, he would not need to have a regular job. Same thing with the bass player, Ned Maloney great bass player, uh, but unfortunately has to have a, a regular job, mm -hmm. you know, to survive and to, uh, to keep, you know, food on the table and, and so on and so forth. So for us to go out and play, we have to be making at least at the minimum what these guys would have made 
had they stayed home for the three, four right. weeks. And that's the rub. That's the thing that has to be. Okay. But it sounds like you're working on making that the reality very soon. Being yes. selective, but smartly selective. As yeah. opposed to getting in that station wagon and playing right. a gig. <laughs> no right. mic night gigs for you. Well, yeah, at this point, I'd rather not, you know. Uh, and I mean, and I mean, and I saw Metallica do it. I was there uh, about 38 years ago. Mm hmm talking to them outside of a club near my house. And uh, I told my singer at the time, I said to Dave, I said, you know, those guys have a lot of balls. They're traveling across the country in, a, in this little, you know, van with a U-Haul on the back. And, uh, and they're making the dream happen, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And I uh, will always remember that, you know. And so for anyone that would say, oh, you know, those guys had it handed, handed to them, you know. No. Provider. They didn't. They worked hard. And even, you know, the police. I remember when they played uh, My Father's Place in Roslyn mm -hmm. Island. They showed up. I mean, I wasn't there that day because I wasn't really a big police fan. But I heard, you know, they showed up, you know, like, you know, literally, I think it was like a, a van, you know with uh, small amounts of equipment. Mm -hmm. But it was what was needed to get the name out there, you know, back then. You can't really do that today. This, the scene has changed. There's not an organic uh, grassroots scene, you know, that's going to take a person from that level and prop them into into the next level. Now it's it's very corporate. Uh, you need you need radio. You you need um, you need social media. Mm -hmm. As much as I hate it, it's a necessary evil. Agreed. You know? For better or for worse, if you don't promote yourself, right. there's very 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 few bands that organically do it outside of the machine and. You know, for every tool, you know, that kind of band, there's a thousand bands that make it the traditional way. That's so true, you know. And, um, you got to do what, what you do. And at the end of the day, yeah, it's not the worst thing in the world if you don't have platinum albums on your wall. <laughs> right. It's not the worst thing. Right. You could be uh, homeless. You could be dying of AIDS or cancer or COVID or yeah, not have pick, your health. Pick your tragedy. They're out there. Um, so it's not the worst thing. Um, <laughs> That's a good rationalization. So what, what I've learned today, Jack, is Souls of the Innocent is still a new album. We have yet to see the touring, but we will see the touring. You're going to keep writing. You're going to keep reamping. And just we have to stay tuned on social media, whether or not we like social media, to keep up on Jack Star. I think that was a tremendous wrap up. Uh, <laughs> it really was good. And then at the end of the day, too, it's like most musicians offer something, you know, to the proceedings. I think what I offer is uh, melodic guitar playing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that people that like that style of playing, um, like uh, Gary Moore, for instance, yeah. uh, Michael Schenker, mm -hmm. Tom Schultz of Boston, are going to really like, they're going to like uh, the last album a lot, and probably the, the three that came before it as well. So that is my final plug, Darren. Outro.